Hey, it's Cole from E Free. I want to thank you for listening to this message. I pray that as you listen, that you would be blessed by this message and that in the right way that God would challenge you in your walk with Jesus. So enjoy the message. I was having iPad troubles and my Mac wanted to drift, but we'll fix that. <laughs> So I just want to give you a word of greeting, and let me put it this way this week. I'm Pastor Steve, part of a growing team of pastors. Amen? Amen. It is so good to see the way that God has been raising up pastors, raising up elders, giving us the leadership that we need in order to accomplish the important work that Jesus Christ has called us to do. And I want to welcome you back to our Trivial Pursuit series. As you can see on the screen, this week marks a transition from trivial pursuits to meaningful pursuits. I've been looking forward to this pivot for quite a while now. And I wish that I could say that this means that the old cynical Solomon has now been entirely replaced by a new man, like that Tre tremendous change that we see in Ebenezer Scrooge as he's transformed after his visit by the three ghosts of Christmas. But as you will see today, even in this more optimistic section that we've been looking forward to now for quite a while, what we're going to find is a blue sky peppered with dark clouds. And I've come to the conclusion that the Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes is an older Solomon still given that tremendous gift of wisdom from God, but also jaded by all of the trivial and outright sinful pursuits of his youth. At best, he seems to be capable of partial sunshine. Now, the slides today are colored to show that movement between various perspectives. Now, our first meaningful pursuit is the pursuit of God's timetable. God's ways are above our ways. But that doesn't mean that he's unknowable. It doesn't mean that his will and purpose for our lives is undiscernible. We can gain God's wisdom to see time and eternity more clearly as we reflect upon God's working in the times and seasons of our lives. So let me provide just a few quick phrases that will give a little bit of a roadmap for this sermon. In the first eight verses of Ecclesiastes 3, the text focuses on a variety of key events that mark the times and seasons of our lives. Then in verses 9 through 15, we're going to consider a different perspective on time, the perspective of forever and eternity. Finally, we're going to shift from time to a focus on the nature of man, considering the breath of life that we share with all the animal kingdom, but then the spirit that God has given to us that is unique to mankind who was created in the image of God. And the first point that I'd like to share is understanding the times and seasons of life. So turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 8. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what has been planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Now in all the book of Ecclesiastes, <coughs> this is probably the most well-known passage. And some of you who are around my age may recall a song that was sung by the birds to the lyrics, turn, turn, turn. And it used the lyrics of this particular passage. Now the most prominent word isn't hard to pick out, time. It appears 28 times in these verses. And there's actually a very interesting structure to this section. 
Notice that there are 14 couplets that are arranged in seven pairs of couplets. And this may actually be quite significant. Throughout our study of the book of Ecclesiastes, we've seen that Solomon makes free, frequent inferences back, back to the very beginning chapters of the Bible, to Genesis and the account of creation. And it may well be that he has chosen these seven couplets in order to remind us of the six creation days and then the seventh day on which God rested. Seven is also a number that often is used in scripture to indicate completion. And in this text, I believe the seven pairs of couplets are intended to represent the complete scope of the seasons of our lives. But they're not organized chronologically, and yet I think that we will see as we jump around that we can relate to many of these times and seasons. Now, the first pair of the couplets, in that first pair, there's a contrast between the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. We, as human beings, and all animals are born and die, but plants are planted and plucked. The second couplet seems to contrast constructive and destructive activities looking through two different windows. Killing and healing impacts humans. The Hebrew word, though, that is translated kill here is not the word for murder. An important distinction is here made. The time to kill seems to suggest either a just war or even capital punishment. And the time for healing comes in the aftermath of that war. Now, the other couplet seems to be from the perspective of buildings that are torn down in a conflict but then need to be rebuilt. There is a time for each of these. Now, I'm especially drawn to this idea of the time to weep and laugh. Because over my many years in ministry, especially in my first church that was a very old congregation, and then my second church that was also an aged congregation, I performed way more funerals than I have here at Geneseo E. Free. And I am very thankful for that fact. But I had tremendous experience in the funeral parlor. And I was always surprised by the fact that I would often walk in at a time of grief and find a surprising amount of laughter. And that is because there is a razor thin line between weeping and laughter. And I think God has designed us this way, that we have an opportunity and a mechanism to release that deep mourning through laughter. The time to mourn and dance further illustrates this thin line. Now the fourth pair of couplets begins with the most confusing of all the couplets. A time to cast stones and a time to gather them. Now, some of the strangest metaphors have been suggested on what these stones mean. In fact, the ancient rabbis saw in this a reference to the times where intimacy was permitted and the times where intimacy was prohibited. Now, I always shy away from these kind of allegorical interpretations, especially embarrassing ones and especially if a more literal translation is possible or explanation. You see, in ancient warfare, stones were scattered so that the occupying enemy would not be able to easily plant or harvest crops. And then when the enemy was repelled, it was the time to gather the stones and plant the crops. Sidney Gray Danis points out that this very strategy was used against the Moabites in 2 Kings chapter 3. He said, we read in 2 Kings that Israel in its war with Moab was instructed, every good piece of land you shall ruin with stones, and Israel complied. On every good piece of land, everyone threw a stone until it was covered. And as a result, the Moabites could neither sow the fields nor reap a harvest and ultimately went home. The time to embrace and the time to refrain from embracing also points to the fact that there are seasons of conflict and then there are seasons of conflict resolution. The fifth pair of couplets are also a bit tricky to make sense of. Now, the time to seek, that makes sense. We've all lost things and had a time of seeking but the time to lose, that seems like an odd admonition. 
but let me just look at it through two different windows. Think about your dating life, or dads, think about your daughters and some of the men that you brought home. Aren't we so thankful when our daughters come to the conclusion, even on their own, that not every man is a keeper? That some of these men need to be sent packing. So there is a time to lose. And if you have been in your basement or storage unit recently, you also understand, yes, there is a time to lose. Now the sixth pair of couplets may suggest a time of mourning. The Hebrew custom when mourning, as we're familiar with, was to tear the garments as an expression of grief. But you know what we don't often receive teaching on is what was done at the end of that mourning period. They would take the clothes that had been torn and sew them back together. It was a testimony to the fact that broken hearts were beginning to heal. The time to keep silence reminds me of Job's friends. For a week after Job had lost everything, including ten children, these comforters remained silent. It was the smartest thing they said. And then they opened their mouths seemingly way too soon. And remember the words of Jesus' brother in James, 2, James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. It's a very powerful and needed word for us. We're so quick to speak even before we've come up with a reasonable thought to express. Finally, the seventh pair of couplets is a bit jarring. The admonition is that there is a time to hate, time to love and a time to hate. The idea of a time to hate seems unworthy until we remember that as believers in Jesus, we have been called to hate what is evil and to love what is good. So yes, there are things that we should hate. Paul's words in Romans 12, 9 may have actually been inspired by Ecclesiastes 3, 8. The closing couplet, that there is a time for war and a time for peace, reminds us yet again of the danger of appeasement or peace at all costs. No amount of appeasement was going to dissuade Adolf Hitler from pursuing his final solution. There are, tragically at times, times where war is needed. Reflecting on these first um, eight verses, now I have to take a brief aside. I'm about to quote somebody, but when I looked at my notes, I had seen that I attributed the quote to Michael Keaton. This is not from Batman. Michael Keaton makes the following observation. The 14 couplets of 3, 2 through 8 cover the whole range of human activity. Over it all, the preacher sees God in complete control. It is a warrant at the same time for both humility and confidence. You see, sometimes the seasons of our life seem to be filled with random occurrences and worse yet, seem to be filled with great tragedies. However, God has purposes that include those seasons of suffering and challenge as we've been seeing earlier in this book. But let's move on from this most well-known poem about times and seasons. And the second thought that I'd like to share is that God has sown eternity into the hearts of all people. Look with me at verses 9 through 15. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what he has driven, been driven away. Now, in my introductory comments, I suggested that I would use color to make point. And the reason that I'm going to do this 
is that Solomon jumps around a great deal and he consistently vacillates between two conflicting viewpoints, two very different worldviews. Now, one of these throughout this series we have referred to as the under the sun perspective. But that under the sun perspective we found has been used in a very technical way to indicate when man becomes untethered from God. When man simply lives his life under the sun with no view of the eternal. But we haven't really given a name to the other viewpoint, nor did Solomon. But for sake of simplicity, I'm going to call the other one the truly sunny perspective. And we're going to mark them with yellow and black backgrounds to bring various points into a more logical order since they're all mixed up together. So as you look at Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 15, notice these more optimistic statements where God's light shines through. God has made everything beautiful in his time. Now, when you read these words in their context, they seem out of context. In the midst of complaining, Solomon just suddenly retreats and shares a bit of sunshine. Solomon's next statement is one of the high watermarks in this chapter. God has put eternity in our hearts. Now, this statement may well have been the inspiration for a very famous quote by Blaise Pascal, the 17th century mathematician and scientist. Pascal said, there is within the heart of man a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. Now, that doesn't mean that all men and women are going to be saved. This is not teaching universalism. Universalism. This sense of the eternal in our hearts can be ignored. Worse yet, it can be stomped out. Yet anyone who has studied the world's religions, and I had the opportunity to do that very deeply for four years, if you've studied the world's religions, you can't miss the fact that even lost and pagan men and women are, as Paul described, the philosophers on Mars Hill that we considered last week very religious. Dave Busick makes the following helpful observation. The well-known missionary and author, Don Richardson, used the phrase eternity in their hearts to describe the phenomenon of redemptive analogies in most all aboriginal cultures. Almost every culture has traditions, customs, or ways of thinking that reflect basic biblical truth. And these can be used by missionaries to explain the gospel. The Apostle Paul asserts that even the most lost of people have and retain a sense of accountability for their sins because God has put within them a voice of conscience. God's placing eternity in our hearts bears testimony to his genuine desire that all would be saved and would come to a knowledge of the truth. But once again, he is not saying that everyone will be saved, but that it is the generous desire of God that we would bow our knees in faith and receive Jesus and experience salvation. Now, the next bit of sunshine is the statement that whatever God does endures. Isn't that a great word? That God never leaves anything half-paked? That God is a finisher? I think of the great promise in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where Paul said, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now Solomon also makes a statement, a statement for the here and now. He reminds us that work and the rewards that come from work are actually a gift from God. You see, not all of our rewards are rewards in heaven. Yes, Jesus encouraged us to store up treasures in heaven, but that doesn't mean that these are the only rewards that we will receive. If you have been given the gift of children, a good and loving and faithful spouse, if you have a job that gives you a sense of fulfillment that you wake up and you're, and you're in a hurry to get to, and I know that's not all of us, but these are all of them examples that there are some things that we can enjoy 
right now. Rewards from God. However, Solomon is also intentionally setting up a contrast between two outlooks which are really reflective of two choices that we can make. And so I'm disappointed to say he lapses back into the under the sun perspective. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we're going to find ourselves reading off repeated phrases and several of them were first introduced right in chapter one of this book. What gain has the worker for all his toil? What has been, what is now already has been. That which is to be already has been. We've been over this ground before. Once again, Solomon is viewing life as predictable, monotonous, overly scripted. This is that fatalistic perspective that we've seen again and again. Nothing that we do seems to matter. What goes around comes around. Now, the last statement is hard to interpret. God seeks what has been driven away. But I found that several commentators suggested that what Solomon means to communicate here in a very complicated Hebrew sentence is that the cycle will repeat. What you succeed in getting away from is only going to come back. Let me put it this way. The shoot flies always return. As we look at this text, I'm struck by the fact that we have a choice at how we can look at life. We can focus on the good and trust God to manage the challenges that inevitably come. Or we can focus on the bad and become hopeless cynics. Years ago, I listened to a lecture. It was a lecture by a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and he had just received a terminal cancer diagnosis. And he actually got down and he did a whole bunch of push-ups. He was ripped. He did not, not look like a man who was about to die in four months. But then in this last lecture, which was incredibly optimistic, he made this statement. You're going to have to choose whether you're going to live your life as a Tigger or an Eeyore. The Tiggers have a lot more fun. But you know, I think this is part of what we're seeing in this book. That there are these two outlooks that we can take in life and the choice that we make is going to make all the difference in the world. I'm always inspired when I think back on my 100-year-old friend, Rosalie. Her life had shrunk so badly. She was now housebound in a small Staten Island apartment. I've mentioned her before. Rosalie was the sunniest person I've ever known. Despite a failing heart, an overall collapse of health, when you live to 100, you're usually not in great shape, and her house, her apartment, had become her prison, and she made her prison into her prayer closet. In fact, every time that I visit her, Cindy and I visited her, she always began by saying, I love the Lord. And she said it over and over again. You see, we have a choice. And tragically, others choose differently than Rosalie when faced with the same challenges, and they become angry and bitter. Now, the third point I'd like to share is that man is more than the, quote, human animal. God has given us both breath and spirit. Look with me in verses 16 through 22. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? 
Now Solomon is intentionally setting up a contrast between these two outlooks that are reflective, as I said, of two sets of choices. And once again, I'm going to use color and group these statements together according to their perspectives. Peppered throughout verses 16 to 22 are the following pessimistic under the sun comments. In the places of justice and righteousness, there is wickedness. Now, just because he is being the pessimist does not mean that he is not making true statements. And there is no denying the truth of this statement. Our legal system in America used to be a shining example for the entire world. But in recent years, we have seen an unequal application of our laws. The COVID pandemic demonstrated how many lawmakers and governmental leaders made rules that were the for thee, but not for me. They carved out exceptions. Since then, we have seen our legal system increasingly be weaponized. And over the last couple of years, this has gone to ridiculous extremes. We cannot even have a presidential election without both sides dragging one another into the courts. And I've heard in the last couple of years a new term, lawfare, using the law as a weapon. And we see this all the time now. Now, the next statement is like the previous ones. Previously, Solomon has complained at how the wise and the fool had the same outcome, that death and decay happened to both the wise man and the foolish man. But now Solomon shifts the comparison between humans and animals and comes to the same conclusion, both of them die. And he said humans have no advantage over the animals. They both die and they go to the one place. And by the one place, he means what in Hebrew is called Sheol, or what is generally being referred to as the grave. Animal and beast alike, they wind up under the dirt. Now, the final under the sun statement is the one that has worked its way into all of our funeral liturgies. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Yet in these same seven verses, there are some bright and sunny statements as well. In verse 17, after bemoaning the corruption in the place of justice, Solomon asserts that God will judge the righteous and the wicked. Despite all of the lawfare and evil, Solomon is still clinging to the belief that God is just and that someday there would be a day of reckoning. But up to this point, that day of reckoning has seemed entirely earthbound. Your sins will catch up with you someday in this life. But Solomon's next sunny statement in verse 21 is the second high watermark in our text. The spirit of the children of man goes upward, whereas the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth. Now, you'll notice that I put that in the form of an assertion. That's important. Because many of the translations, including our ESV translation, make this into a question. They use words like, perhaps the spirit of the man goes upward and the beast downward. Or who knows whether the spirit of the man goes upward. Now, the question is actually a very technical one. It all comes down to what value you place under a single Hebrew consonant corresponding to our letter H. Is this haw, like he haw, or is it he? Now, this is actually extremely important because if it's a ha, then it's a question. If it's a haw, then it's a statement. But I think that there is very good reason to believe that this is an assertion, not a question. You see, Hebrew is a tricky language because it is a language of consonants. Now, that doesn't mean there are no vowels, because no human speech is possible with only consonants. But when written, it was written with only the consonants, and reading Hebrew is like reading the classified ads. You just have all these missing vowels. However, there were oral traditions that preserved the proper vowel to use so that the language is readable. And later on, they put in this whole pointing system so that we would know how to pronounce it. 
When we go back to the most ancient of the rabbinical scribes, what we find is they always use the haw and not the ha. And that means that this is a statement, a statement that something very different happens with the spirit of the man than the spirit of the animal. The spirit of the man goes upward. You see, God has given mankind a greater destiny, this spirit that goes upwards. And these words are similar to Job's statement in chapter 14, 7 through 9, suggesting the possibility of a resurrection. Job said, for there is hope for a tree if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its root grow old in the earth and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. When Job looked at this tree stump that was now sprouting anew, he said, is it possible that the tree stump has a better destiny than humanity? And that is why he shared these words. It was just a faint glimmer of hope that God would resurrect the human being. You see, in these grand questions of time and eternity, there are many glimmers of hope in the Hebrew scriptures. However, the sunny perspective concerning time is so much clearer in the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament. Consider just a few of these. We see that there is a time for a savior, in Galatians 4, 4 through 5, for when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, so that all under the law might be redeemed. And then in Mark 1, 14, 14 through 15, Jesus begins his earthly ministry with the pronouncement, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And when there was an early attempt to do Jesus harm, John reports that no one laid hands on him because his hour had not come. Hints and doubtful assertions are now supplanted by strong statements that God is in control of time and all of human history. So let me introduce one final color change in our slides. Red to point towards Jesus' sacrifice for us. As we progress towards the Easter season, let us take note that God's timetable becomes crystal clear concerning Jesus' suffering and death. In John chapter 13, verse 1, we read, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, and we see the same clear sense of God's timetable in Matthew 26, 18 where Jesus sends his disciples to go and to make preparations for his last supper with them. And he said to them, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And then reflecting back on Jesus' sacrifice, the apostle Paul said to the Roman believers, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So do you see how finely tuned this idea of the progression of purposeful time is? In light of these gospel truths, let me share three final takeaway points very briefly. And the first is this. Viewing time from an under-the-sun perspective leads to a very dark view of God. God is seen as detached and capricious. Might I strain for a moment at the, at the leash of language and say it this way? Bad chronology leads to bad theology. If we understand time incorrectly, if we go and look at it through this under the sun perspective, it will lead to a bad understanding, a false understanding of who God is. Number two, Viewing time from God's perspective, we begin to see his hand even in the messy and tragic experience and events of life. Over the past several weeks, I've been very aware of passing from one season of life to another. Now, I thought that this empty nest stage of life was going to be filled with lots and lots more time. 
I wasn't counting on adding a half dozen doctor appointments and medical tests to my calendar. You see, we pass through the stages of life so quickly, and aging truly is not for the faint of heart. But I realize that these are still good times, because I look and I see how God is blessing our church, and I see how God is blessing my son and my daughter. You see, even hard times can be good times because God is in them. Finally, one more. Viewing time from the perspective of the cross enables us to see that all history is his story of love and redemption. Life need not be monotonous. We serve a God who is magnanimous. We serve a Savior who said, I have come in order that you might have life and in order that you might have it more abundantly. He gives us the grace that we do not deserve. He places eternity in our hearts. And we are not naked apes, as the evolutionists say. Our spirit goes upward where we will stand before Jesus and give an account for our lives. Are you ready to meet him? Are you ready for that face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ? If in that moment, when you stand before Jesus, the only thing that comes to your mind to say is, well, God, I know I made a lot of mistakes, but I did a lot of stuff right. And I tried to be a very good person. And I had neighbors down the block. Now, they were awful people. But I still rake their leaves for them sometimes. If that's your defense, then you're going down. But if you stand before Jesus in that day, genuinely remorseful for your sins, owning your sin, and you look into his face and say, I have only one plea, Jesus, save me. If you have prayed and received Jesus as your Savior, and in standing before him, if you are standing under the covering of his blood, then despite all of the wickedness that you have ever committed, you will be saved because the gift of salvation is a free gift. All that God wants is that we would embrace that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, maybe there's somebody here today who has just been trusting in being a good person, just trusting that someday God will welcome them into heaven because they've tried hard. But Lord, I'm listening to the words that Steve is speaking, and I'm realizing that's not enough, that your word makes it clear that there is a decision that I must make, that I must open my heart and soul to the influence of the living God. And so, Lord Jesus, right now I confess my sins. And I ask you, Lord, that you would help me to stop covering them up in my mind, but to openly expose them before you and to ask for your forgiveness. And Lord Jesus, I have tried to manage my sin, and it's been a total mess. I need you to take these sins away from me. I need forgiveness right now. So Lord Jesus, I pray that you would forgive my sins. I pray that you would cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give me the gift of eternal life. I confess now with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe right now in my heart that he is my Savior. And I ask you, Lord, to now cleanse me completely. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. I receive it in faith. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this message. We would love to hear from you and learn how God may have challenged you or blessed you as you listen to this message, especially if you feel that you are ready to take your next steps in your walk with Jesus. So contact our church at any time. We would love to hear from you, and we look forward to connecting with you. But in the meantime, God bless.